Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's kind of middle of the week recap. We missed posting the recap this past Sunday. We had a plan for it though. We had planned because it was Mother's Day weekend, we were gonna go on Saturday when Aaron's mom was out of town. We were gonna plant some things for her and then Aaron was gonna edit the video so we could have a, kind of something different go up on Mother's Day. And it didn't work out because the weather kind of, we got stormed out. Yeah. And so we weren't able to film that so we well, had and nothing. Well it's supposed to get cold too. It's supposed to get 30. 30 yeah. degrees. So tomorrow night is supposed to be 30 degrees is the low. Right now it's 38 degrees. That's why we decided to film this recap kind of uh, randomly. I mean, I, not that I would rather be outside planting things, but kind Kinda, of. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have rather be out planting things, but it's right now 38 degrees. The wind is blowing and it's pouring, which is awesome. I'm not going to complain about that. We have planted some annual containers with sweet potato vine. I just think, and caladiums. We pulled the caladium pots in last night because uh, like tonight the low is 35, mm -hmm. tomorrow night's is 30, and then it's like 34, 38, and then we get back up into the 40s. Um, the containers that we have sweet potato vine in, I'm gonna tent tonight, which that means I will be tenting 14 containers, mm -hmm. which is okay because I already have like pre-cut pieces because I've had to tent them before. Um, they should be fine because it won't be. Well, and even if you had to replace the sweet potato vine, it's a flat and a half which is a bummer, but it's also not like, it doesn't ruin your annu you know, your annuals for the year. Yeah, and they're easier to find. I mean, I've got some other things in those pots, like yeah. the James Britannia, I probably mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to That's replace right, yeah. that. So anyway. Some are more rare. Yeah. We so, should do, we should start doing uh, like rare annual plant hauls. Yeah, <laughs> we should. <laughs> rare as in these don't come out till next year. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah, so I'm not actually sure what this week is going to hold because we were supposed to, you know, we, we have been uh, installing some big trees in the landscape. The last one was supposed to be installed this morning, but everything's pushed because everything is so wet. Um, so everybody has to wait uh, for things to dry out to like get big machinery around. And so it's just kind of throwing everything. So you know what though? I'm embracing it. It makes me feel like less in a rush. This whole year mm -hmm. has just felt so glorious and just so relaxed. And I feel like we're just letting things play out like the cut flower garden by this time last year I feel like well maybe not last year we were just putting in that space when did I start planting I don't even remember I feel like I planted seeds earlier than I yeah like is I planted some in third? April is this the third planting year of that cut no flower? it's the second wow only the second yeah we've made a lot of progress so we were spreading mulch uh, in the walkways remember yeah and then we had to get water or maybe the water was already there. I don't Isn't know. Isn't that weird how you just forget timelines so quickly? It wasn't but that long ago either. I know that I seeded a bunch of stuff last year, like Larkspur, um, uh, what else did I seed? White Finch Orlea, some Phlox, um, Nigella early, like probably beginning of April, and here we are in May. I haven't even seeded anything out there. A lot of it self-seeded, so it's, it's coming up. But we're just kind of, you know, going with the flow because you have to with the weather, and I know a lot of you guys are in the same boat. So anyway... We'll figure out some other, well, there's lots of things to work on. So anyway, we'll figure out something to do this afternoon while it's still raining. So let's jump into the videos from this past week. First one is planting five different types of shrubs at our friend's house. So the, the house that has like the brand new blank slate landscape, we've been uh, adding just a few things here and there. And so we took a black lace elderberry, a double file viburnum, some oh so easy Italian ice roses, um, some Calicanthus Aphrodite, which is brand new to me. I've never grown it before. So thank you to all of you who left comments about your experience with that because I have none. Speaking of that, they just mulched uh, the last yeah. couple days. She sent me a couple photos. So we'll put them on the screen of what, uh, what it looks like. Mulch is just... It makes it look so much better. Yeah. Stonehenge Dark, dru dark Druid. Druid. You. That was the fifth one. So we just placed those around and planted them. And I think they look nice. Uh, so Chris Arfan said, I played Laura yesterday and planted two new shrubs, which involved moving two shrubs. I took your advice and changed something I wasn't completely happy with. I'm so happy to hear that. I'm hoping and praying the new locations will work well. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. I really appreciate, appreciate it and so do my plants. That's the thing, like, you know, we move stuff all the time, either due to new projects that we're clearing the way for, or just because something isn't quite working out. Remember in our last, in our townhouse, we planted that Scarlet Curls Willow mm -hmm. three times. Did we really? Yes, because we planted it directly in the corner and then we thought, oh, well, dang it, that's not gonna work. I have my chicken coop I need to put in that corner. So we needed to move it, so we dug it up and we moved it and then it needed to be moved like six inches to the right. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, so we dug that thing up several times and it, I mean, it's huge and gorgeous right now still yeah. <laughs> where, it, where it is. But that's the thing, like nothing is permanent. It doesn't have to be anyway. So, you know, if you have the gumption <laughs> to go out there and move or stuff the around. machinery. When we were talking to Nathan, the tree <laughs> plants, tree transplanting guy, um, he was talking about moving trees. He's like, yeah, it's kind of like moving furniture. You know, it's like, it's a little bit of work, you know, cause they're heavy and stuff, but ultimately, you know, we can just get it done in like an hour. I never move furniture. I'm one of those. <laughs> like we find a, something that works and like, yeah. boom, that's how it's going to be for the rest of our life. Well, also we have a weird living room too. We do kind of. Yeah. It's very wide. Yeah. It's like you could have three different rooms, but you want everything to kind of point at the fireplace because the fireplace well, is... If you have a large amount of people, you want it to be all kind of one space to where you can all be together and not feel yeah. like you're separated in the same room. Right. It works well so for we us. Keep it, keep it works well for us though because you have like a uh, conversational grouping around the fireplace and then off to one side, we've got um, like the kid area, mm -hmm. which that's how we've like lived our... That's how we've done it. Yeah. Like we all kind of exist together in the great room kitchen area and like that little TV room kind of all downstairs. And so the kids just have a toy cabinet and toys are just all, I mean, it's just life. Toys are all over all the time, but mostly like in, in that corner, corner. Sort of, yeah. Yeah, it works out great. Plenty of space for that. Uh, Barbara said, when I see the air conditioner in the video, it makes me wonder if geothermal heating slash cooling systems are popular in your area. And is this something you would consider for your home? I think you have to have the right, you have to be in the right area for like geothermal, right? Like we do have some hot springs uh, that are like 15 minutes away. And I know that there are some are geothermal. 15 minutes away? Well, in Vail, like 20, yeah. 20 miles down the road. Yeah. And I know that there's some like operations Outside. that utilize geothermal, but I don't really understand how that all works. I, I just assume that it's like, oh, you have to be in a location where you could make that, like the heat from the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think you can just do that anywhere. Maybe you can. I, I don't, don't know. know enough about it. I was kind of hoping you'd yeah. chime in on that question. <laughs> well, that's my belief is that uh -huh. that's what I always thought is you have to be in an area where it would, it where would work. It would work. Holly said, I remember a while back you mentioned your mom's advice to have certain foliage colors in every garden. I think it was blue, green, yellow, and red slash purple. I tried to find that video, but I never could. If you would please address this again, that would be so helpful. You nailed it. Uh, blue, green, yellow, and red slash purple. If you have those four colors, and I don't know where she picked that up, somewhere along the way. Um, and what about black? <clears throat> Black that petunias. would be that would be your red slash purple. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it's like kind of a broad kind of sure. um, groupings, I guess. But even if you ha you don't like yellow, say, but it, let's say that you put a an ornamental grass that has a ti the tiniest little stripe of yellow in it. For some reason, that like pulls everything together as long as you've got your other three colors. And I'm not talking about monochromatic spaces because like an all green space, like moon gardens, where you do mm -hmm. different shades of green and then white flowers, things like that. I mean, there's an beautiful themed gardens but it's on purpose you mm -hmm. know and if you're trying to create just a really pleasing to look at uh garden just making sure you have a little bit of each one of those colors instead of everything um all green but kind of all the same shade of green so nothing really you know it's kind of like having different textures in there too uh, it just sets things apart from one another mm -hmm. i think housewoman said how long will it take for the plants to get full size you know Every single one of them is gonna be completely different. Um, like the black lace elderberry that we planted that's this big, it'll be full size in what, like three years? Mm -hmm. Like it'll be like 12 feet tall. Easily in three years, it'll be maybe even two. Uh, they yeah. grow so, so fast. But calicanthus, I have zero clue how that one's gonna grow. Uh, I've actually got some here that we're gonna try planting because I thought, well, we're gonna plant some over here because it's on their plan. Maybe they do well here and I, you know, the designer knows something I don't know. Um, so we're going to give it a shot. I have a feeling they're not going to do well here. <laughs> I think they need more acidic soil and more protection than we can give them. But I like would be happy to be proven wrong in that, that case. Um, and you know, like the evergreen that I don't know about the, the you, the new variety, usually they're like a, an average grower, kind of moderate, but you know, sometimes things will grow faster than others in the same like plant family so anyway everything just will be different and everybody's house is different too mm -hmm. based on your soil composition I mean, you can be in the same area and be like one house away from another and it, your soil can be completely different the exposure can be a little bit different and things just grow differently it's just kind of wild Melissa said, I spy raised beds in the future, looking forward to more of this and keep, and I keep thinking, do professional landscapers use biotone and land slash sea compost like Laura does? 
I'm sure you there know, are some. <clears throat> Espoma actually sells a like landscape version of Biotone, and I, I think that it's been confused in the past because uh, you can find it online, uh, like different places, <clears throat> but it's like a landscape version. I don't know if it's mixed differently or if it's the exact same. Does stuff. the label look similar? The label has like less colors on it. Oh. Because when people are using it, it's like they're using less ink for the... Because it's like when landscapers yeah. are buying it in bulk. Right. It's like you don't need flashy marketing, mm -hmm. you know. Right. But when it's at a garden center, you kind of do require... You want it to stand out. You want it to mm -hmm. stand out. So yeah, that makes that sense. Makes sense. Um, but yeah, they, so they do. Interesting. Well, and people like Benny. Um, yeah. You know, there's so many people in our area that are like really gung-ho about Espoma products, which yes. is funny. But like, you know, Benny's another... Your parents have sold it forever, but mm -hmm. um, Benny is another guy who... Like he's had a couple experiences where he used this, but like, you know, 10 years ago or mm -hmm. more, he used them on a project and then just like saw the results mm -hmm. in an area that was troublesome or whatever. Like there was one issue where they were having with pine trees mm -hmm. and they used a ton of tree tone. And he was like, they perked up after that. And we were having such issues. And he was like, I was sold. Mm -hmm. Like that was it for me. I was like, okay, this is what we're going to use. Mm -hmm. So proof is in the pudding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tannis said, I was curious about the black lace elderberry. I was wondering if they are the same as the other elderberries that you can save the seeds and cook into elderberry syrup. I believe it is supposed to have high amounts of health benefits. I think they are like really high in vitamin C and antioxidants probably. The, so the black lace elderberry is a Sambucus nigra, I think is how you say it. Um, and the and, and it's a European type elderberry. Now there's American elderberries too. And they're Sambucus, I gotta look it up. <laughs> can't remember. Sambucus canadensis, American elderberries, they are better for berry production. Like you will get berries from the black lace if you don't prune on it at the wrong time because they do bloom on old wood. So the only time you would want to prune your elderberry is immediately after it blooms. Um, and that way it still has time to set buds for the next year's uh, flowers and uh, berries. There are some that we let go. We don't we don't um, harvest any berries off of ours. They're pretty small. I think they're smaller than your typical like uh, American elderberry. And those would be like Nova and York are two that I'm familiar familiar with. So the Sambucus nigra, the black lace elderberry, is grown more, mostly for ornamental, for the shape and color of its leaves, uh, the blooms, and the berries are nice. I mean, like birds kind of clean them up a bit. Um, they're never a mess in the garden at all. So yeah, that's. All I know about that. <laughs> Jody said, it looks great. I watch every video and have learned a lot. Thank you. So do your shoes get a lot of dirt in them when doing your holes? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes, they do. I'm just like so used to it now. I grew up with no shoes on like all the time, just bare feet. So it almost feels like-, like Borderline I'm, feral. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's almost like I'm just walking on the, the ground outside. I do stop occasionally and empty them out. I like to show you how much I've yeah. collected. Like, hey, Aaron, check this out. <laughs> I right. pour my shoe out. It's nice though because the vans that I wear, they are just good for my feet. I know they're probably not great like support forever. I'll probably have to change my shoes at some point, but my feet feel good in them. Like they're never tired. I don't deal with foot pain and I can slip them on and off. They can get wet and dirty and muddy and I can throw them in the wash or not. The dirt just kind of like wears off of them eventually. They've just been a really good one for me. Uh, Morgan said, love those raised beds. Would you have more information on those? Aaron, I was thinking about those. I know they're metal mm -hmm. and wood. The ones at Stephanie's? Yes. Do you, did you look at them more than I did? I mean, it was just kind of a cursory walk by. You know by. what? In my memory, I would say that they were like corrugated metal yes. with uh, like wood frames. Yeah. That's probably what it is. Was there like a, a wood cap, like a yeah. two by four? Maybe we'll sh stop and Yeah. It just looks you. like it's framed in with... Um, like it's corrugated metal, it's just framed in with, you know, pressure treated lumber. And I know that in one of the raised bed videos, we've done two raised bed where we've taken a look at your guys' raised beds, I know that there have been some very similar. Yeah. Like a few with the metal sides. I think they look, they have a really neat look to them. LS said, what is the edge of the beds around the house? It looks like some type of custom concrete. Yes, it is. Um, is that typical in your area? A lot yes, of people is. do uh, do that. I battle the aggressive Bermuda grass that gets into my flower beds that won't, won't really help with that so much. I don't know how deep those go. Do you know how deep they go? Uh, they don't go deep at all. Yeah, so Bermuda grass would probably go right underneath mm -hmm. it and pop up in your flower beds. I mean, it might. They're basically off just on the surface of the ground. Sure. What are your thoughts on the best type of flower bed edging? I think that is completely personal opinion. 
on, on flower bed edging. I can see the merits of like cutting out your flower beds and putting in that custom concrete edge. Just a machine, like you can make the flower beds any shape you want, but then the machine comes in and like pours all the concrete for them. What I don't like about that, the cons for me is that it's not something you can change. I mean, unless you want somebody to come pour them again. Um, so I like the flexibility of being mm -hmm. able to widen or, or not widen or reduce mm -hmm. the size of flower beds as we, you know, do new projects or how, as we want to. Um, also, it's they, not even really all that uh, less maintenance doing the concrete because really? you still have to trim against it. Uh -huh. And if you don't have that, you can just trim vertically, just flip your trimmer upside down uh -huh. and trim vertically one way. Mm -hmm. So it's not even as if it's a huge maintenance saver sure. by doing that. And it really like it's tidy. It is tidy, but if you let the grass, don't trim the grass and let the grass kind of like flop over tidy. it, then it's not tidy. Um, they do kind of break down over time, like I, probably a long time, but I've mm. seen a lot of places where like some of it's buckled. Or and... if you have a cable guy that comes along that needs to get a uh, wire underneath it. Oh, how many times have you had to do that? A lot, but um, they can, it can like crack and you know, you try to, you try not to, uh -huh. but yeah, if you are messing with it, you... Well, if it's old and like starting right. to fall apart anyway. Um, so yeah, I think it's totally personal. If you like that kind of look and you want to just carve out your flower beds and like have them be, there's something to be said for that. I mean, we drive by houses every once in a while where the grass like just grows right up to the house and there's just tidy and clean and there's a sidewalk up to the front and I look at that and I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> something about that that makes me want to just move in, like no yeah. maintenance. <laughs> um, of course, I, could know, I couldn't actually live yeah. in a place like that. For like... 20 minutes right and then you'd be like I like, that's like a something. vacation spot where yeah. you know um where there's no work but i would go crazy if i didn't have stuff yeah. to do outside uh anyway totally personal opinion on that i you like know what looks really good for edging though is that uh steel edging. yes um we saw that in newport when yeah. betty let us you come. find that in like i think that's expensive yeah i think that's like custom done because i've seen options online of things that you can buy and it doesn't look the same as like the estates I'll bet they spend a lot of money on that type of edging. Probably. We were at the Newport Flower Show, um, and so the house right next to him, the owner uh, invited us over to come and look at her space, and we had um, tea, and it was wonderful. And we, I noticed that for the first time, really. I'd probably seen it before, but I'd noticed it in her garden. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It had kind of rusted like that patina, but it didn't scream at you. Yeah, very it, formal, very tidy. it kept a very tidy edge, yep. Kelsey said, you scared me when you said Black Lace Elderberry is down to zone five. five. I'm a zone four and just bought two of them. I went and double checked Proven Winner's website and it says they're hardy in my area down to zone four. I must have said the zone wrong. Mm. I haven't double checked the video, but I thought that I would bring that up because I noticed that was a, that was a common comment. Well, zone you know, a lot of, sometimes tags can be printed wrong too. I don't so think you it might probably was it. though. I was giving out so many stats mm. and plants. It's easy that I could jumble something, but it is a zone four through seven. So if I said that wrong, I, I do apologize. Uh, Bonita said, what size auger drill bit are you using? I need to plant some flowers and shrubs, but I have knee trouble. This would help a lot. Mm. It's a nine inch. It's a nine inch power planter auger with a cement drill, cement mixer cement yeah. mixer drill and it's got a handle on it well you can it's buy the whole in. combo on um power, Planter. on power planters website. yeah and the the nine inch augers now they didn't have this in the beginning but they have that little pilot hole kind of bit on the yeah. end they call it a heavy duty tip heavy duty tip that i right think there. that's all standard now is it? i don't think you can get it without the heavy duty which tip is so anymore. smart yeah. it really does help when you've got harder Do you know soils? you can get a heavy duty tip on the three inch really yeah so here's what I would say to you about augers. Um, they're awesome. Like, it has been a game changer for us because it's just so much more efficient and fast. You do have to be strong. Um, you have, I would, I would say that if you have any weakness, if you consider yourself a weak armed person or if you have weak wrists or your hands struggle, I wouldn't recommend that you use one. Um, I've heard about a lot of people who, cause if it catches on something and you don't have a good grip, that's why I like I power stance. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it, it looks weird, but I like power stance when I'm using it because uh, they're heavy and yeah. They're great, but they're for confident people. Well, yes. Confident and competent, too, because you could you could rip something. Right, and so. if you've never used one before or been around somebody who's used one before and you're not expecting it to hit and like, jar you, I've heard of them spinning around and like breaking wrists and mm. stuff like that. It can happen, so I would just like caution you um, that like it's awesome and amazing, but definitely make sure you're braced for it, depending on your soil. 
Like there's some areas where I drill, uh, drill holes and it just goes in like butter so easy. And there's some areas where like I break a sweat digging yeah. one hole with an auger and I'm just standing there, yeah. but you're like so like uh, tense. tense. Yeah, Whew. In, the, in the center of the loop out there in the South Garden, that spot is just like, it's so compacted out there. Oh, that's a hard spot to dig holes. Hence why that spot doesn't have very much stuff in it yet. I kind of like, I don't know if it's subconscious, but I like avoid those spots. I shouldn't. Sarah said, can you plant larger things like trees and berms? Yes, you can. And actually it's really great because trees don't want to be planted low. They want to be planted high. And depending on the size of the berm, it does help facilitate drainage. So your plant will be very happy up in something like that. My brother and sister-in-law have a paper bark uh, birch in one of their flower beds where it's kind of slightly up. Mm -hmm. That tree is gorgeous. It's beautiful. And you can tell like it was planted at the top of a little bit of a, a berm. Now the berms, and these flower beds are a little bit intense. And I do know that Stephanie went along and she said she was going to flatten a lot of them mm. a little bit more because, um, you know, the person that they had come in, I don't know if they did it when they weren't home or whatever, but they were, they're pretty intense berms. Um, they just wanted a little bit of contour. So I think it might look a little different. In fact, I, I think she may have replanted the black lace because she said she was going to flatten stuff out. Oh, really? And I told her, just pop it out of its hole, flatten the berm and just replant it. Sure. Kind of in the same spot. Okay, let's move on to the next video. Two new perennials for 2023, the Heliopsis Bit of Honey and the Agastache, uh, what was that one called? Raspberry? Moon. Was it Moon? I don't know. No, that's a, that's a Caladium. Is it? Yeah. Why? It feels like I planted those a million years ago. Isn't that weird? It was just like a few days ago. Meant to be royal raspberry. Absolutely beautiful. The leaves on that one are kind of like a dark, dark green, almost kind of like, like you might think there's burgundy on the underside of the leaves. And then the bit of honey has white leaves with green veining, so green variegation on it. Really pretty. Uh, and they are coming out 2023. We got our hands on them earlier. Typically, you know, because we've been working with Proven Winners for a number of years now, they do send out things early so we can try them out, get a little bit of experience under our belt because by the time you guys are seeing them in the garden centers, maybe it's helpful to hear our experience with them um, or if that's what we're hoping anyway. Hannah said, not sure if this is new or if I've just started noticing it, but the zone map that Ken pops up when you say the zones for plants is really helpful. Those little touches make your videos so educational and practical for this newbie. Thank you, Ken. Go in the extra mile. Jennifer said, my husband, 51 year old, had just had open heart surgery. He's doing great. That's so good to hear. I got to the hospital today. Um, I played today's video and when he heard Laura's happy greeting, he chuckled and said, so glad I'm here to listen to that every morning. Garden video is our morning tradition. That is just so amazing, encouraging to hear, and I wish your husband the speediest of recoveries. Thank you for watching our videos. Anne said, hey Laura and Erin, did I miss you showing the tulip and daffodils near the cut shed slash meadow garden? I've been waiting and waiting to see how it looks with all, of, all those bulbs. I can't wait to see them. Um, you know, we never did a formal tour. I did post some things on Instagram, so, um, we can yeah. put up some pic the pictures you posted. Yeah, so here's the deal. I was kind of like waiting to see what would happen. And sometimes that, that just happens where you think that there's gonna be this glorious moment and it never really, <laughs> yeah, it never, and it really comes to fruition. So in that space, you know, we didn't put anything on top of the soil in terms of like mulch or, or amendments. And so the soil is very white um, and very chalky. like chalky looking. Yes, yes. And the bulbs did come up. It was a dry, fairly mild winter and a lot of them bloomed right at the top of the soil surface like they came up and there was a daffodil like no leaves but a daffodil flower like <laughs> coming up out of the soil like this it was the weirdest thing so i was kind of waiting because then we started to get a bunch of rain and i did notice them starting to i think it was a moisture issue mm. i think they needed more and like it's making up for it yeah so much which is awesome but there was never a moment where i mean there was a moment where it looked pretty to me i kept trying to take pictures and nothing would translate and that happens sometimes well it was also a little <clears> awkward <throat> too because you know it was so compacted in that area and where you had augged a lot of holes um it was it had kind of settled it a little sunk. bit yeah. so they were flowers that were coming up in this kind of sunken area i still think that next year after we level the whole area because mm -hmm. the bulbs will stay down yeah. there we'll level the whole we're area just gonna level the surface just kind of um, yeah. yeah we'll just bring in just some, some topsoil yeah and then we'll level it um and then 
we'll plant this grass seed yeah. and it'll look Right nice. now there is a crop of weeds, which we are gonna mow down before they go to seed because they are a, kind of a noxious weed. They're pretty when they bloom, but they are a noxious weed. Um, so we'll take care of that. But yeah, there was really, it just was kind of a weird deal. And we do try to show updates on things, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. And um, yeah, I've seen a lot of comments about where's a tour of the meadow garden and I don't know. Texas My Texas said, what a treat. Love Saturday morning videos. You know what I'm really looking forward to? A full garden tour. I've missed those. We are planning on it this week, hopefully. Well, okay, so one of the reasons we haven't done it is that we're getting these big trees installed and we kind of wanted to do a video of just the trees mm -hmm. and we want to do a separate video of just like the, the garden, whole garden tour, the whole garden. But the problem is that it's taking a while to get the trees installed, so if we do a garden tour, you'll see like some of the big trees installed. No, you'd see all of them. I mean, there's not that many. Well, there's three. You'd see two of the three. Yeah, you'd see two of the three. And it kind of, I don't know, we kind of want to make that its own thing because yeah. they're glorious. Right. They're glorious trees. We'll, we'll do it. But you know what we could do is we could just do one of the South Garden. Yeah, none of the trees are going up in the South Garden. We could do it, I suppose. Yeah. I'm just so excited about everything. Like today, Chad's actually out there. I mean, bless his heart. He and his crew, they're pulling out the fence between the back garden and the, the driveway. It's gonna look so weird. It's gonna be awesome. Oh my gosh. I should tell him to pull out the boxwoods next. Next. Oh. <laughs> Sarah said, oh my goodness, love, love, love the new varieties. Since they are rated two zones below you guys, isn't it an option to put them in pots? Yes. I'm a zone four. I love exotic, unique plants, and I'm just wondering what plants you would suggest putting in pots besides the usual super junior varieties. Funny you should say that. You will see this video maybe before this one even goes up, but we just planted the 10 big pots along our fence line. I didn't use a single super tunia. I was kind of like proud of myself a little bit. I mean, super tunias, there's a reason why they're like the number one annual seller out there because they are amazing. And I do have a lot of them I'm gonna be using, um, but I kind of wanted a little bit of a change myself, you know, in those pots. So I used mm -hmm. some different things, one of which is actually, was one of them brand new? One, no, one, two, three of them are new, two, no. I have to remember, I think three of them, I used four different varieties, three of which are brand new varieties this year. Like you could get your hands on them at, at certain garden centers. Um, anyway, yeah, so I, I feel you there. We'll do some different things. We did our back shade porch pots too, which, um, you know, they're shady, shadier, so you couldn't use super tunia, but I used some really beautiful things in there too that I'm really excited to show you. Karen said, good morning from the other side of North America. I'm in New Brunswick, Canada, and I'm so excited to see a video this morning. Uh, oh yeah, this one went up on a Saturday. We had kind of like a little bit of a, lineup of videos yeah. we decided to put an extra one out we've had snow over the last four days and i'm so jealous watching you work your soil with your hands question for you i trimmed my butterfly bush to about 12 inches it looks so scraggly did i do the wrong thing so with butterfly bushes it's an interesting thing they are very late to break dormancy so you usually want to wait to prune until you see some growth um, and so that might mean that like I, I know some of them were actually pruning for the second time right now um, because I came through and I pruned some of them right above where I thought a couple of strong buds were gonna be. But all of our butterfly bushes, like all the branches died back this year. It's weird. I've got a big poof of fresh growth at the base of all of my butterfly bushes and all of them, even if they had little buds forming and leaves kind of starting to push up top, they all like dried up. So we're taking ours all back. So I don't think you did the wrong thing for sure, um, but typically you wanna wait till you see growth and then you just kind of assess the, the shrub and take it down to the point where you see the strongest sets of leaves coming out of the existing branches. Stacy said, just curious, do you have to blow out the drip system at the end of the season to prevent overwinter? Also, you must have fantastic pressure to push the water the furthest part of the, from the source. So we don't blow out a drip system because all the water drips out of it just on its own. We blow out like the Sprinklers. irrigation system, um, like sprinkler lines where the water kind of sits in those PVC pipes, but not our drip zones. And then our pressure, I think it depends on how you run your zones. We've got how many zones like for the South Garden with the big loop of grass? How three, three zones yeah. total for that space. We did a three quarter inch supply line and then we're pretty strategic about how much um, drip tubing we run off of each one of those zones and we try to do it like the most efficient way possible. Do you have anything to add to that? Not really. Do we we have, do have good pressure out there. I was going to ask if we had particularly good pressure. Yeah, something. although it's it's neck down at the, there's like a filter. At the helm. Well, there's a, there's a filter on each zone. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that filter knocks it down. Benny told me it's either 25, 35, or 50 PSI. 
I don't remember. There's a little bit of a difference me. between <laughs> 25 and 50, Aaron. Yeah, I don't recall what he said it knocked it down to, but because um, I was asking him, I was like, is there, you know, do, am I dealing with maybe too much pressure coming through? Um, but he was saying that, that that filter knocks it down. It's if, probably 25. If your drip tubing sings, <laughs> then it's too much pressure. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> One of our zones out there just like whistles. Well, because we, we need have to run so more. many zones, mm -hmm. and some of them have very little drip tubing on them. Yeah, that one section. So if you are like coming from our house and you're taking the one little grass section to the cut flower garden, on the right hand side we have a bunch of stuff like where the berry beds are. We've got blue spruces and lindens and all kinds of stuff in there. But on the left side, all we've planted so far are the three birch trees kind of in the center, and then like a few little shrubs right at the entryway. We just haven't developed that space at all. And so that one zone, like eventually we'll have it maxed mm -hmm. probably uh, but right now it just like woo, yeah. when, <laughs> when it's on martha said i really enjoy all your explanations about the plants but as a new learning gardener the explanation about how you plant the plants at soil level below or above the soil level with fertilizer when planting or after planted is so very helpful for me too there's so much um i find i don't know and you're such a good teacher i just love comments like that because um well it's it's a nice comment, but also it reminds me that not everybody is a seasoned gardener. And sometimes I, I forget that because it's something I do every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just the very basics, I kind of in my mind, like maybe subconsciously think, well, everybody knows how to do that. Well, you don't want to sound but, like a broken record either. Well, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it's, I feel that way every time I plant potatoes or garlic. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I do this every single year. But then I realize that, you know, our audience changes. We're getting new people who are watching our videos all the time. And um, and a lot, of, a lot of who maybe have never gardened before. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thank you for the reminder. I do appreciate comments like that because it's helpful to me to kind of steer mm -hmm. what we're doing and maybe not address it every time, but make sure to throw it in there every once in a while. Cynthia said, does the Proven Winners hyssop tend to take over? I grew some from seed last year and it quadrupled in size. I divided, uh, I divided it so that the other plants had room. That's typically what a lot of seed varieties you'll get are older varieties and uh, or like standard varieties. I don't know how else to explain that, but like a lot of calendulas, you start from seed. They will seed themselves all over the place. Same with the hyssop, it'll spread itself around. But a lot of the Proven Winners varieties aren't allowed to be a Proven Winners variety unless it stands above, if it sets itself above the rest of the plants in its own class. So a lot of times the plants are bred to be a little bit smaller, easier to maintain, better bloom habit, better growth habit, won't take over your life and your garden space sort of growth habit. Um, so, you know, I haven't ever grown this one, so we'll see what happens. I don't mind if it kind of wants to get, like grow around in that area, I think it would be absolutely beautiful. And some plants, that's just the nature of them. That's what they're gonna do a little bit more than others. So that's something I'll report back to you after it's been out there for a little bit. Next video is planting new varieties of Monarda slash Phlox in the rain. Again, these I think are new for 2023. Monarda upscale lavender taffeta, and then the Phlox is a coral sunset, luminary coral sunset, both like oh, in the, the light department or the color department. Mm -hmm. They are lighting it up out there, very bright pink. Uh, Kayla said the new plants are really pretty. I can't help noticing each time you show that area how sweet the little lady statue looks out there. It provides such, some other interest out there and gives it life. Love it. The little um, like peasant statue mm -hmm. that you got me. So that statue traveled from our townhouse, right? Mm -hmm. I think you gave it to me there for Christmas or a birthday. Mm -hmm. And then it lived, it lived in the triangle-shaped garden for a while when we first moved here. And that's where I stain, stained her, showed how to stain concrete. And then we moved her in that video underneath the blue spruce that fell down. And when the blue spruce fell down, like she was still standing, mm -hmm. like just, it was amazing. And then we moved her out to South, the South Garden and she does look perfect kind of tucked in back there. I love that. First question, is Erin testing a new camera? Gorgeous shots of the rain. What camera did you use for that one? Was that not your phone? Uh, I used my phone in that video and I also just used our regular cameras. The Canon cameras? Yeah. Yeah. Lynn said, I'd just like to say that whoever edits these videos is masterful and the choices of music are always fantastic. I really love the acoustic guitar music in this video, so beautiful. Good job, Ken. Uh, Bonnie said, I absolutely love that you kept planting in the rain. There's something so refreshing about rain and I just love the smell. I'm not used to planting in the rain. So that was actually kind of a treat a little bit. I mean, until it started to pour and I was starting to like, water was just dripping. I actually had, I went inside and dried myself off, like dried my hair fully. It was like I had just been right. in the shower. Um, do you know how much rain you've gotten this spring? Have you heard? No. Way but I, more than normal. I do, I read like an article 
like a local paper article, something about how it's like one of the wettest and coldest, which is not hard to figure out that it's one of the coldest for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, especially having freezing temperatures in May, mm -hmm. that's really unheard of for us. Yeah. But, but it's been very wet too, which is great. Yeah, no I complaints. wonder, somebody's measuring the rain. Yeah. I wonder how much we've gotten, where, where, where can we find that information? Yeah, I don't know. Extension office? Question, do the amaranth not like vermiculite on top of the seed tray? Uh, so I did plant vermiculite when it started to rain, or vermiculite, <laughs> amaranth. I feel like I'm planting vermiculite every once in a while. I use so much of it, but I did not use that on the top of the amaranth tray. I don't think it would hurt anything. All the amaranth is up. In fact, it's up and I've thinned it already down to two plants per cell and then I'll thin it again later. I mean, they're up about like half inch or so. So success on the amaranth. Jen said, spanning the South Garden was magical with the rain. A question though, did I miss your opening of the jugs from winter sowing? Are yours doing well? We have not opened them yet. Well, we've opened one. One of the poppy ones was looking a little bit like, ooh, it needs to be open and get some air. I think we'll probably open them up this week. I was looking in there the other day. Most of them look pretty good. They're not huge though it's been so cold yeah. like it hasn't been hot enough for long enough for things to really flourish once we get some heat units and this, you know things will start to boom a little bit more but there's growth surprisingly i let a lot of them grow, uh, dry out so anyway if some of them are a little sketch it's because uh, of me Leslie said, one of the simple pleasures in life is sitting in the greenhouse listening to it rain while I work. Yes, I did that yesterday. It was Mother's Day. And uh, Samantha was sleeping. You were playing with Benjamin, I think. And I came out to water the greenhouse and it just started to pour. And I just sat, there's a chair with a little footstool in there. And I just sat in there, just like, it was awesome. I was wondering how the poppies that you and your mom seeded over the winter at both of your places are doing. Goose egg. Goose egg. <laughs> Nothing. I think because we had such a prolonged dry winter, like there was no moisture. And then it, it um, warmed up so early that I think it was warm enough for things to start to sprout and things, but there was no moisture. But you never know with all the rain that we have here, that seed may just have been sitting there. Mm -hmm. We'll see if anything comes up. I even pulled up the bamboo stakes and stuff that we had laid out to indicate where they were. I roughly know where everything's at. We'll see if anything happens, but we've been tromping around out there and I kind of just think that maybe it needs to happen in a more moist climate. Mm -hmm. I should go spread some out right now. Yeah. But the thing is, is that they need that cold period. They need, that seed needs that cold period in order to like um, spur on, I guess, mm -hmm. germination. And uh, they wouldn't get that now. Not a prolonged enough cold period, hopefully. A. Nicole said, thank you for sharing your garden and knowledge with us. I was wondering, once the trees start getting larger, do you have a designated spot that will be strictly full sun for the plants you may have to move? Nope, we go with the flow around here. Also, a lot of our plants get rehomed to friends' houses or family or whoever wants to come dig them out. If something no longer works for this space, I have certain people that I just, like, text. Speed dial. Yeah, and I'm like, hey, I've got this, this, and this. Do you want to come get them? You've got X amount of days before you know, we're done with it. Annie Linkus said, can you update us on the veggies you started early in the greenhouse? You know, I think I've been doing most of my updates on Instagram, maybe in pictures. I did a few stories. I do think, did I not show you in the end of this video how things were doing? I think I showed it in some vlog at some point this past week. But um, in terms of the spring vegetables, the greens did really well. Spinach, not as well as the lettuce did. Uh, there's still lettuce in there. Uh, the carrots are wonderful I, in fact i can start harvesting them now they've got i don't know pretty good size i could let them grow a little bit more beets are perfect i've actually harvested a few that got a little bit too big toward the edges it's weird maybe they were warmer toward the edge and they like bulbed up really fast so those chickens got those the rest of them are ready to harvest and eat the uh, beans we've been harvesting and eating i gave some to your parents um and i could probably harvest another batch for dinner tonight like almost every day or every other day i could harvest beans it's amazing and it kind of goes to show i was thinking about how few plants you actually need to produce a lot of food mm -hmm. um, and you know we go ahead and plant like you know however many hundreds of feet of several things you know and then it's it becomes kind of a beast to harvest it's something you have to plan for like if you want to grow a lot of food. I mean, there's the tending along the way, but then harvest is such a tremendous chore if you want to keep on harvesting things. And that's why like in that space, I want to set up a really good system of having people come in and harvest for themselves. Um, and then also we'll want to preserve some for us. It's just an evolving process that we're learning every year, but I don't know how many bean plants I have in total in there, but I mean, probably 10, 
just produce so many beans. Snap peas are wonderful. They're just starting to really produce a little bit more consistently. What else did I plant in there? Tomatoes, we've eaten three tomatoes. Samantha got the first one. She ate the whole thing down. Yeah. And when she, she pulled it off the plant, and I was like, oh. <laughs> and she popped it in her mouth. And I thought, oh, that's gonna be a little bit of a waste because she will probably spit it out. Nope. She's a savory girl. Down she the likes, hatch. yeah, down the hatch. She loved it. Um, and then I've eaten the other two out there. Uh, Charlie said, I look forward to your videos. I've been re inspired to garden more. You and your family bring a bright spot uh, is not in a not always beautiful world. Wondering, do you keep the plant tags next to your plantings to remember names and varieties? I should. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking I'll remember varieties and not remembering them. So I do a lot of plowing through old videos. <laughs> like, okay, I swear I planted this in a video. Which one did I plant it in? Let well, me we find it so I can find the variety name. Next video is visiting a tree farm and other plant shopping. So we visited um, a lab tree farm. It's in Nampa, Idaho. I didn't even know that it was there. Me neither. We learned from Benny who, you know, he, his crew put our Hartley floor in and they do a lot of our brick sidewalks and irrigation, all of that stuff around here. And he was telling us about how he's working on this huge home somewhere near us. And they had bought the, like, I don't know how many, seven, like mm -hmm. big trees. And we were like, <laughs> big trees, huh? Well, especially you, like you yeah. perked up and got all the information and you yeah. contacted Nathan, who's the owner of Malad Tree Farm and asked if we could come out. And so we did, and it was amazing and it was fun. Like yeah. you just kind of like, I don't know. It was kind of my thing more than your thing. Yeah. I mean, but I'm a big fan of big trees. Yeah. So that was really fun, especially I'd never been around a tree spade. I mean, I've seen them in videos and such, but never been like standing there watching that process happen. Yeah. So we did, we thought it would be fun. And like we said, I think earlier in this video, as soon as we get that last one installed, we have uh, taken video and stuff so that we can show you kind of what the process has been like and what they do, their staking system. It's pretty intense. They do everything. They do all the installation, which is nice. so nice. Sandra said, it's exciting to see Aaron in his glory and you loving that he is so happy. That was a fun day. Yeah. Kathy said, what a fun day for you two. Aaron really does love the big trees, doesn't he? <laughs> love this video. Do you have any redbud trees planted in the South Garden? That's one of my favorite trees. We do. We have four forest pansy redbuds and one eastern redbud planted out there. I had, I bought last year an Oklahoma Sweetheart um, redbud and we wintered it over in a container back behind the greenhouse and it did not survive. I wasn't ready to plant it last year because it's a pink, white, and green variegated, and usually those type of trees, and red buds sometimes for us, you need to plant them like as an understory tree, so somewhere where they are being protected by something else or sheltered like from any like real bad winds or the intense sun in the afternoon, and I just really couldn't find the location. I knew so much was gonna be changing out here by the Hartley, and I thought, a beautiful specimen to have close to the Hartley. So I am bummed. I'm hopeful that we can find it again. I'm sure we will. And that just happens. We winter stuff over and try to do as best as we can with it. And sometimes it just doesn't work. And I'm kind of so used to it that it's like, well, it didn't work. We'll just try again yeah. next time. Uh, Diane said, my favorite tree is the Schwedler maple. Schwedler. Hmm. Or I think that's how you say it. Uh, breaks dormancy with red leaves, then turns deep green as the season progresses. That sounds pretty. They are the parent that the Crimson King Maple was hybridized from, which stays red all season. Have you heard of it there? I have never heard of that tree. Crimson, Crimson Kings, of course, I've heard of, um, but not the Schwedler. I'm going to have to look that up. Yep. It'll be interesting. Attention uh, said, this is sort of a spring blooming tree tour and I've been wanting one of those from you guys forever. Does the big tree place sell to regular people or is this through your garden, parents' garden center? I think they sell to whoever. Yeah. Regular, I mean, you just Anybody. call them. I don't think they, they're not like open like a retail store. I think you would want to contact him and just say like, <clears throat> hey, can I come what, look? What he does is when you contact him, he kind of gives you the like, okay, are you prepared? This is not a, an inexpensive thing. Mm -hmm. And then, um, once he kind of gives you like an idea of what you'll be looking at price wise, you know, if, if you want to do that, then he'll just set up an appointment and you'll just walk the tree yard with him mm -hmm. and you know, you get a lot of information that way. Yeah. That's really fun. Cause he's been at it for 35 years. Plus he had like a full blown landscape company, like with huge crews that did design yeah. and installation and things like he's, that. He's got an interesting story. He had this landscape company and, um, 08, 09 came around and just, nothing he mm -hmm. got like all of his work went away but he had all these trees that were planted 
And so they just kind of sat there. He kept tending to them. And then as the market came back, he just started selling big trees. I've got big trees now. <laughs> yeah, but he also got into the market of having the machinery to be able to move it. He mm -hmm. said a lot of times people will either have the machinery to move it, but not the trees, or they'll have the trees, but not the machinery, and they'll mm -hmm. contract with someone else to move the trees. But he actually has both, so that's kind of nice. Also, the machines, he was telling me brand new, one of those tree spades, the big ones, they're like $450,000. Yeah. So like, it makes sense why he needs to charge, not only because all of his time mm -hmm. and, and land and when everything. When you put 20 years into yeah, a tree. You put 20 years into a tree, and then the machine to move it costs 450000 mm -hmm. So like, you gotta charge a little bit to, yeah. to move those around. He did say though that uh, like 40% of his business is just transplanting other people's trees. So if you've got a tree in your yard that's in the wrong spot, he'll mm -hmm. come and move it to the right spot mm -hmm. that you want it to be in. Cause mm -hmm. say you're putting in a pool or, mm -hmm. you know, you want to keep something, Right. he moves those around. So that's cool too. I did ask him if it made him sad when certain trees sold yeah. and he said it did. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. Even if it's in a lineup of other trees, it's like, I don't know, you put yourself into these plants for right. a while. And I'm not usually very sentimental about stuff like that, but about some things, especially if you've had them forever. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, Stacy Taylor said, such a satisfying video. I'm with Aaron when it comes to trees. Do those size trees at Milad have any kind of guarantee? They do. He guarantees them for a year. That but is, she said he doesn't want to guarantee anymore. And I told him, I wouldn't blame you for getting rid of that. People know what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. Like when you, should we talk about the plant guarantee policy again? because <laughs> no, you'll get all hot and bothered. <laughs> I will, and I'll start to get flushed. Yeah. Mm. I mean... Yes, when you're spending money, because we, we bought these trees. It's not like we're getting any special discount on these trees at all. Um, but when you spend that kind of money, it is kind of uh, comforting to know that there's... A, and it's a little different, too, because he's installing. He's kind of guaranteeing the installing process and the staking and all of that, which I can kind of see a little bit more merit to. But he can't uh, guarantee that we're going to water him correctly. Exactly. Or know? that, you know, I don't know, some freak storm or right. dip in temperature or whatever, you know. You Although, can't... like, if, if it does, he knows the area. If it does blow over, you know, he's the one that's staking it. So you're kind of trusting that that he's staking it correctly. Yeah. You and know? you guys, one of them's going fairly close to the Hartley. And I, most <laughs> of you know that. And I'm like, first of all, I told Aaron, you call the insurance company. You yeah. make sure that Hartley's on our policy. And then... Um, I asked him, like, can whatever you do for staking, can we just like, double it or triple it? And he said, yeah, we'll do more. We'll do definitely do more. So I'm actually pretty confident. And we've had the night after the first big one was installed, uh, we had like a bad windstorm. It kept me up. Mm -hmm. It kept me up at did night. Did you see it knock down one of the old trees yes. at the cemetery? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. It was horrible. It was just howling and like huge gusts would come and I could hear the branches of like the birch trees because those are fairly close to our bedroom. I could hear them like knocking and they were like squeaking too. Like everything was kind of moaning with the wind. It was weird. I thought, of course we have a gale force windstorm, you know, when we just had this huge tree put in, but it's just like perfect. Mm -hmm. So I have a pretty, I have confidence that it's going to be okay. <laughs> Lisa said, how long before transplanting do you need to root prune? I know these aren't trees, but I need to move four established boxwoods and I'm so nervous I'm going to kill them. He said it's pretty routine. Like they root prune, I think every spring, mm -hmm. like early in the spring. And then uh, he, to prep the trees, he cut them again uh, about like a week before he started to move them to our garden. Because, you know, you have to call dig line and you have to, like there's a process before you can dig these massive holes. Um, so he went out like the day that we picked out our trees, he went out and cut around them and he said that that just kind of stunts them and kind of like preps them a little bit and if you do that and then let them sit for a minute before you actually pull them out of their little home there um it's better on the tree and he's been doing it for a while so i think he's he's pretty confident i think in his yeah. ability to so snappy said when you say many times that certain invasive plants are not invasive in your area what do you think that is i understand not having certain pest problems in your area but what makes a plant invasive in some areas and not in others I think conditions completely. Conditions, climate, uh, you know, for example, butterfly bushes. Uh, there's some sterile varieties that you don't have to worry about, but like older varieties that are not sterile, they'll throw seed everywhere. And if you have the conditions for those seeds to sprout and come up, then uh, 
species can quickly become invasive. So the state of Oregon has termed butterfly bushes that are non-sterile invasive, but that's really for only the western side of the state. Where we are on the eastern side, it's too dry, uh, and we it's not they're not invasive at all. It's a, a bummer that we mm -hmm. can't plant like the pugster. I can't plant that here, or we can't buy that here. I suppose I could go buy it somewhere in Idaho and bring mm -hmm. it here, and like. Somebody turn me in for that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, probably, I probably wouldn't put that in a video, but they're gorgeous butterfly bushes. And um, anyway, we can't grow them because they're technically illegal in the state yeah. of Oregon to grow, even though we have zero conditions here in our particular area for them to produce. We do have invasive things though, like white top and puncture vine and bindweed, all those kinds of things that want to take over quickly because they like the conditions that they're in. Yeah. Anything to add to that? Yeah, it's, we're just too dry. I think our summer, it doesn't get enough rain to where like a lot of things that would ordinarily survive they like we're just too dry for too long and we mm -hmm. can keep things alive you know with a little supplemental water but mm -hmm. not naturally see what happens with this weather that we've been having we're kind of like if we could just have one rain like we'd be we'd be re getting rain like every other day mm -hmm. um if we could have just one rain a week yeah like, how would that nice. change our landscape yeah you know that would be interesting uh, Brenda said, when buying older mature trees, how many more years can you expect that tree to live on average? Totally. Probably forever. I mean, not forever, well, no. but like trees last a long time. They do. Given I, the right conditions. A lot of trees have a specific lifespan, though. They'll start to like, like willows after a certain amount of time. It's a long time, though. Yeah, but like the, a lot of them will last like 100 years. Yeah, I more. think it depends, too, on conditions. Again, like if they're protected or if they're getting proper water, proper care. Um, all those things will yeah. play play in. I mean, certainly you're buying older trees, so of course you're gonna have like 10 less years with that tree because yeah. it's 10 years old or 15 years old or whatever, but who knows how much longer after that because it all depends on how they're treated. Next video is planting bush clematis, which is the Stand By Me lavender variety, brand new this year, really pretty. Stand By Me, the, the old standby variety, which is more blue than purple, we've had in our garden for multiple years and it does phenomenally and once it starts to bloom it feels like it's always in bloom until really a hard frost they're an amazing plant ornamental oregano so drops of Jup jupiter which i think was maybe new last year but it's one of my favorite perennials out there right now so bright and beautiful and then a bloomerang lilac tree which usually you see bloomerangs as a shrub which that's what they are bloomerang dark purple we have one in our garden kind of up by leyland cypress we planted many years ago it still lives and blooms and does great uh, but we found it at my parents' garden center. They got them grafted onto a trunk. So it's like the small ornamental tree. Super excited to try that out because it's done so well for us. Lilacs tend to do well for us anyway because they like high pH soil, which there's not a lot that does. Anyway, got that in the ground. It looks awesome. Teresa said, love Russell doing his business. Oh, that was actually cheddar. Doing his business in the mulch while Laura is showing us the clematis and the oregano. <sighs> There's no editing that out too. It was like right in the middle of my tour yeah. of these beautiful plants and there's cheddar. Jeez, life with cats. I hardly ever seen them, see them do that in the flower beds. Yeah, we saw cheddar doing that in the grass the other day. That's yeah. weird. Like a dog. Yeah, like a dog. Yeah. I'd rather bury it. Yeah. Seasons with Anthony said, how do they get the plants to look like trees? What does grafted mean? So they take a trunk off of something else, some, something that's maybe tougher. Sometimes the variety is tougher uh, and they've got really good growth characteristics and they will graft another plant on top. So they basically put two plants together and they kind of like grow together, like root together almost. Um, so a lot of times on a grafted tree, you'll see that union. It'll be like a little swollen area where the two have been put together. It's really interesting. There's so probably a do lot. They, of... Do they just um, trim, like just pick a leader on you know woody uh, woody shrub, and then just trim just off the it. bottom and just keep keep trimming off bottom branches as it's growing up? I'm sure. I mean, because that's how like the instructions on how to create a hydrangea tree and stuff. Uh -huh. That's how you do it. It's all in in training. Yeah and things but I don't know like because some of those trunks are clean like they are like really clean and right. you don't see a lot of where I wonder how many years old something like that is I don't know like be... three four five years old or something we need to go tour like a place like Bountiful Farms it'd be fun to see somewhere where there's all the different stages yeah because you know? they do so much topiary and standards and like some really cool espalier things and that would be really interesting to learn more about the process because you know a lot of my experiences with finished product you know because my parents garden center where i grew up and worked and all of that we get finished product you know we don't well kind of it's growing in a container so all the pre-work has been done up to that point so it's mm -hmm. really interesting 
to learn more about the process. I felt that way learning about how plants were tested. Mm -hmm. Like you have no idea when you work at a garden center, everything just shows up. It looks great, you know, and you have no idea the years and the the testing all the varieties trialing. that don't make it yeah well for example like the james britannia which you will see in a container that we planted this last week i was talking to um proven winners and they said it took like 30 years for 30 yeah Whoa. it's like since 1990 um for a good variety of james britannia to be hybridized because before, it's a type of South African phlox, before they were so woody and it wasn't like a nice lush sort of thing that you could really market as a really good annual for a container because it would get, the growth habit was not pleasant and the flowers would be more sporadic, but now they're like these nice tight lush plants that bloom all season long. So some plants, it's intense how long goes into them. Intense, yeah. but interesting. Tab Kent said, I've heard you talk about how the wood chips are nice because you can get a lot for a low cost, but I know you would like them darker. Have you heard about dyeing your wood chips? An ad came across my phone the other day and it was a dye made for that. It goes in a pump sprayer and it makes them dark brown. I bought some. <laughs> I found some on Amazon that uh, it was like in Enviro dye or so. It's supposed to be like good, you know. Like safe? Safe for the environment. Like it's just, you know, nothing. Have you fully researched that though? No, I haven't. Because I feel like you should before we use it because <laughs> while... I wouldn't care so much. Well, there will be people I mean, who will. There's dyes in our food um, that, we all, eat. that we eat all the time. Yeah. Like all right. the time. Mm -hmm. It's in a lot of stuff. So uh, my guess is that like if, you know, there's, since there's so many food grade dyes, there's probably, you know, stuff in, in the quantities that you're spraying it on mulch. Mm -hmm. It's not as if, you know, you're just like dumping, you know, hundreds of gallons of it on your property my question though like on the wood chips for example they're so lightly colored if you spray it with a dye and then you rough up a patch you just have to have the dye ready to go spray it again that seems like a heck yeah, of a it, lot of work it might be unless your base color was initially dark and so it's got kind of a dark tone to it already here's the plan so i got the dye because i was curious and i wanted to try it out mm -hmm. i'll try it out so that i can have some experience are you gonna make a video about it maybe you should but we are I worked out a deal with um, to get more compost. So we already have one load out there. Yeah. We're going to get like six truckloads of compost. We're putting compost on top of the wood chips, not even a mulch. It's like actual legit compost to yeah. help condition the soil and feed it. But it's nice and dark. And yes. I think that's the route that we're going to go. And it was cheaper than some of the other stuff that they had previously. So anyway, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the rub. You should make a video about that though. I think it, it would be interesting. Yeah. For sure. I want to be out there though when you spray it. Like, yeah. let me know. Because I kind of want to see how what, it goes What on. you would almost want is like to, to tumble it somehow. You know, like if you could spray the wood chips and get all the way around them. <sighs> that seems and like spread them, but that'd the be amount a lot of work. time that you yeah. take, like just buy the mulch dark yeah. already, you know. All those factors, uh, unless you have all the time in the world and that's what you want to spend your time doing, then it's worth it. <laughs> I want to be planting other things. Uh, EJ said, have you considered mounding up and planting a few areas out in the South Garden, even just a slight gradual mounded area? We considered it. And I'm kind of... I don't of, feel like you did consider it well, early I did. on. I, I feel yeah, like because we were going to do like the whole berm around the outside member. We had talked about oh. like all kinds of different ways we could do yeah. that. Like we were really kind of serious about it, but I am just not a fan of making contours in land where it doesn't exist naturally. I just, I have a really hard time, like gradual, like you said, gradual would be okay if it was just because a little berm goes a long way. And I feel like maybe on the corners we could have maybe bermed it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. In the end, I don't think it's gonna matter. It's gonna be so thick and with, yeah. with plants that you probably wouldn't even really notice a berm. Maybe you would, I don't know. Maybe we'll regret it one day. Yeah. But I'm happy with how things are forming up. And we're learning as we go. Like that whole area, there is zero design. Zero design. It really is like DIY. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Th and there's freedom in that, right? Yeah. Like we just get to have fun with plants. And if it ends up looking awesome in the end, then. Great. <laughs> Yay. Uh, B, uh, B. Dylan said, I just broke my ankle a couple months ago and I'm still recovering. I noticed Laura's scar on her foot. Is there a story there? Scar on my foot. Do I have a scar on my foot? You have a tan line on your foot. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I wonder if that's what they saw. Probably. I have the most intense tan line. So my pants usually go to my ankles, and then I always wear my van. So there's like a section that's always exposed all year. All year. Yeah. And it is like several shades. Several shades darker down there. It's like the reverse of one of those like ankle, uh, what do you, like when you're a criminal and you have one of those ankle 
Oh, um. Things on? What are those called? A bracelet? Ankle bracelet? Yeah. I yeah. I think there's a different name for that. Well, I'm glad you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you to Good for one. me. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, staying out of trouble. Um, yeah, I think it's probably the tan lines talking right there. AI, oh, and I hope your ankle gets better really quickly. What a bummer time to have a broken, a bummer time anytime to have a broken ankle, but right in the start of heavy duty garden season, that would be tough. AICG said, so confused, let's set the record straight. Laura, which cat is doing his business at 825? Half are saying Russell, half are saying Cheddar. It's Cheddar. And I know the confusion is there because Cheddar doesn't make his appearance nearly as much as Russell does. It's usually Russell. Russell is much darker in color. Not much darker, much. slightly darker. If you were to put the two up next to each other. I can hardly other, tell the difference when I can only see one of them. I have a hard time knowing which one it is. If I see them together, I can, you know, it's like twins. You know, you're like, well, if you're together, I know which one you are, but. I can totally that's tell how the I difference. Feel. <laughs> Yvonne said, beautiful plants. Question Do you ever get sore? You work so hard and do all that lifting. Thanks for sharing and have a lovely day. I don't. I, Just a machine. No, I rarely get sore. But let me tell you, the, the one time I do get sore is if we get big plant loads. Because at the garden center, when we got big plant loads with flats of plants, like I carry two flats at one time. So one flat on each arm. I was so uh, like toned to that. Um, and my muscles were ready for it. But now when we get loads of plants here or if I'm helping down there or whatever, my um, like right in here and mm -hmm. right here does get sore from mm -hmm. the gripping because my arms just aren't as used to that. Also, I did get a little bit sore. I did this spring because the year prior to last year, I was pregnant most, well, all of the growing season basically. And so I just was careful about how much I lifted. And then last year I, you know, had had Samantha, but I had a C-section and I had some issues with my C-section area, like nerve problems and um, pain that I didn't have the first time. And so I was pretty careful last year too. Mm -hmm. Like I just didn't want to mess anything up. And so I didn't lift nearly as much and we had good help last year and we, we still have good help this year, but I'm getting into it a lot more because I, that's what I want to be doing. So when I hauled off into some bigger stuff earlier this year, I did get a little sore. Like I had, like my back was sore. Um, but not, I think when you do it over and over again, you just get used to it. Last video was planting a Japanese maple in a pot plus tips on growing trees in pots. So that big container kind of near our kitchen door area, we've got the big uh, concrete table. The Japanese maple that I planted in there, actually a friend has sent me a screenshot and she's like, did you mean to do this? I planted, cause I wanted a, the same Japanese maple that I had had in there previously. I planted uh, and put the video up May 5th of 2017. And I happened to put the exact same video up on May 5th of 2022. Wow. So it lived for almost five years in that container before it had a weird, we had a weird cold snap the prior year and it killed the top out of it, remember mm -hmm. that? So I pruned it all down tried to prune out the dead and then it just kind of struggled and it went to a friend's house. So it lived on, it didn't, we didn't pitch it or anything cause there was still some life in the bottom, but I need, I wanted the height there. Like that was the whole point of that arrangement. So I just wanted to go over some of the tips and what I've learned about growing trees in pots. Plus I showed you a really beautiful dressed up ball gown hookah that's new out next year. It's such a beautiful plant over there. I just am loving it so much. I feel like five years is a good run for uh for a 79.99 that's retail yeah now we do get a discount buying it at my parents garden center of course my parents don't want to make money off of us mm -hmm. buying plants but if you were buying that tree blood good japanese maples are kind of sorry i interrupted you there no i was just gonna say 80 bucks i feel like yeah. it's a good a good amount of money to get five years enjoyment out of a plant yeah like if, if that's all it lasts that's how much is that enough. that's like less than 20 dollars a year yeah 15, what's five and 18? 17 uh, 15 15 Fifteen dollars. Uh, roughly fifteen dollars a year for your centerpiece. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. Math majors over here. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> that was a good run for that tree, and I wanted that same look, and I loved the way it turned out. Linda said you should do a tree slash shrub in a pot video submission. Oh, for your series on your on the gardens, also a Japanese col uh, maple collection one. Someone here said that they have over 200 Whoa. Japanese maples. 
I love to see that. Linda, that is a great idea. In fact, we talked about possibly, we're still wanting to do the shed, like kind of the she shed, shed video. We got some great submissions for that one. Haven't had a chance to film it up to this point because we've been doing so much, but maybe on one of these real crummy days, yeah. we can pop in here and do that. And then maybe that'd be a great idea for our next submission video. Uh, Tyrena said, would you use the same fertilizer in your pot and in the landscape? You can. Um, so if you're not using fresh soil, a lot of times I'll toss Biotone starter fertilizer into my container that has existing evergreens. We just planted the barn pots. They have boxwood spirals in them. So of course we're not taking all the stuff out and replacing the soil, but you got to recharge it because that soil, you know, the plants utilize all the nutrition. So basically it's like a holding spot for the plants. That's not really you like giving anything back to the plant. So the plant is basically relying on whatever you give it. So um, when we just planted those up, I kind of scraped some of the soil and then put Biotone in there uh, just to kind of recharge it before I put my annuals in. Also last year, we had really good luck with recharging soil using the land and sea compost. Oh, that's true. Do you remember? Yeah. Yes, I do. We put that in all the college pots. Yeah, too? like instead of soil, because I was even questioning you about that. I was like, should we be putting, you know, putting compost as opposed to putting in just, you know, regular soil mm -hmm. in the top? And you were like, oh, it'll be fine. <laughs> and it ended up like they were awesome. Those plants like thrived. They did. And the college, because, you know, we came in and planted the college stuff and they had a bunch of planters, but they didn't clean out the soil. And I have no idea how old that it's soil old. was. You could tell. Yeah. You could tell that it was, was like, some nasty soil. It was like gray. Soil. And so we just decided like no potting soil. We're do doing 100% line and sea on the top here. Yeah. I'm so glad we did. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yes, great. Jania said, I planted a Japanese maple in a pot last year. The pot is pretty much the same diameter as yours and made of the same materi material. So I'm wondering what to do with the soil level gets really low in the pot. Can I just add more soil to the top or bring the tree up and fill in underneath? Um, as it gets lower, yeah, you'll want to make sure that you don't bury your tree any lower. So, I mean, if it's possible for you to lift the tree up and add a little bit more below, that's fine. A lot of times, though, it's just a matter of keeping up on adding a little bit more on the top of the soil surface because the tree kind of pushes itself up in a way most of the time. Anyway, when it um, you know starts rooting in and getting closer to the bottom of the pot. Uh, so, yeah, just make sure that you're not burying the trunk any deeper than it currently is. Unless you see a bunch of roots and stuff on the top. In which case, it might mean that it's time to get it out into the landscape too. That's one of the indicators. Alex said, have you ever considered bottomless pots? You know, that is such a good idea and I cannot remember the name of the designer. Isn't she in the UK? Yes, and I know that you guys said it in the comment section and it's evading me at the moment. Um, but she cuts the bottoms out of pots if they're in an area where there's soil underneath, of course, like in a flower bed or whatever situation. That way the tree has the pot, you know, soil reservoir, but then also can grow into the native area the native soil and so that's like prolonging the life of this plant and the eliminate, though. yeah eliminating the need to transplant it later in this area it's a no no can do because that pot is sitting on top of a concrete patio and so there's a lot of situations I feel like where you want vertical interest where you can't plant something it's too little of an area or you don't have you can't dig a hole in a concrete patio so it gives you that option but yeah if, I think it if you have this situation where you can cut the bottom out and let them grow, that's awesome. And the last question is from Carol. Would you water with warm water in the winter? Uh, you water them in the winter for sure, especially if you have long, dry, windy winters, which we can tend to have here. Um, but we water every two to three weeks and we just use water out of our frost-free hydrants. It's cold. I probably wouldn't do warm water. I don't, you wouldn't want to trick anything into thinking it's later in the season than it actually is. I just use cold what whatever like whatever water comes out of the tap and that is it for today's video it is still pretty much the same outside right now windy a little bit raining gray wonder what the temperature is now it's 38 when we started it's now 40. Ooh. <laughs> so it's supposed to thunder thunderstorm here in a couple hours and then just be cloudy for the rest of the day with a high or a low tonight of 35 and tomorrow's low it has raised one degree to 31. Nice. Yeah. So there's that buffer. Anyway, the next eight days after Tuesday, though, look great, like getting close to 80. Our weather's weird this year. Hope you guys are all having a great day. Have a great rest of the week, and we will. We plan to do normal for this next weekend's recap. If we can. We'll see what happens. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.